Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're ready to begin. And uh, a couple of things that I wanted to just very quickly cover with you. Number one, uh, I do have a joke to tell or to read. <laughs> but number two, I was telling you in our, one of our first lessons, I spoke to you about either first or second lesson. I talked to you or told you the story of a gentleman who was healed in Tiffin, Ohio. I was going through some old files this week, and this dropped out, Mr. John Ross, and it's his letter, it's postmarked 19, May 9th, 1994, and it's his letter and testimony to me, handwritten, confirming what I told you of his healing and all that God had done to him and for him, I should say. And uh, he tells a story. I can't read it now. I should have read it at home. But uh, it, I, wanted to, I wanted to let you know that I wasn't telling a story. I was telling the truth. <laughs> and so, uh, and then he, he also sent, he's one of a few that sent doctor's reports to me because I wanted it confirmed because I knew that the tendency of humanity is to not believe the story or to doubt and say, well, you know, that he may think that's true, but th there's, there's another story behind the story. So that's what, number one. Number two, a local priest and pastor stood by the side of the road holding up a sign that said, the end is near. Turn yourself around now before it's too late. They planned to hold up the sign to each passing car. Leave us alone, will you? yelled the first driver as he sped by. From around the curb, they heard a big splash. Do you think, said the one to pastor to the priest, do you think we should have just put up a sign that said bridge out ahead <laughs> instead? <laughs> All right, well, we are on our second part of Capital Punishment, what the Bible has to say, our series on what the Bible has to say about specific subjects. We are on part two of capital punishment. I came in yesterday and wrote down this and the back is filled with even more information than the front so that I would have that in front of you and it would help you if you are indeed taking notes. Last week we covered the definition, point number one, the background and definition of capital punishment, more commonly known as the death penalty. Uh, and then we also covered the two philosophical views. We covered those views to the best of our ability in a secular fashion without utilizing scripture. Of course, the most important input that we can receive is from the scriptures. And so we're on point three, what does the Bible say about capital punishment? The, the question we're dealing with that really forms the <clears throat> purpose of, of these lessons on capital punishment is should the government take the life of a person who has been convicted of certain crimes? That's really the question we're dealing with. Does the government have the power? What does the Bible have to say about that? Should the government be involved in taking an individual's life, carrying out what is called the death penalty? So today we're going to talk about what the Bible has to say about capital punishment, and it has a lot to say about it not only in the Old Testament, but the Bible also uses uh, references or mentions capital punishment in the New Testament. So first of all, we're going to talk about the fact that why, why is the Bible important in regards to discussion of civil law? And that is because the laws expressed within the Bible were meant to form the foundation of civil government. In fact, all Christian nations, of course now in, in the day that we live in, this day of wokeness, uh, very few nations claim to be Christian, including the United States of America. There's this constant battle and upheaval and uh, certain segments of the press pull out their hair if you call our nation a Christian nation. But those nations that in the past claimed to be Christian nations all used the Bible and scriptures for the foundation of their civil government 
and for the structure of the civil government and for the parameters of that which was legal and not legal. There is an old, there is an old statement that indicates the importance of law and it says this, and I may have said it before, that which is legal in one generation will be considered legitimate by the next. And so the laws that we make to an up and coming generation, to children growing up in a nation, if laws legalize a certain thing and the, and the polling and, and all of statistics reveal that there is very little difference, if any, between church attending and non-church non attending individuals in regards, unfortunately, in regards to their moral stance as far as our young people are concerned, that is, if it's legalized, then in their mind it's legitimate. And so that's why there should be such a battle over what we legalize and why laws are important. So the Bible is a foundation. Our forefathers knew this. Uh, a gentleman named Dr. Lutz, a historian, researched the writings of our forefathers, going through multiple thousands and thousands of them, and discovered that the most quoted source of their political philosophical ideas in their letters to one another and in their writings, the most quoted source that our forefathers used was the, Bi was the Bible. In fact, 34% of their total quotes, over one third of the quotes they made, and they would use other individuals such as Locke and Blackstone. These are other writers that they referred to, but the Bible far outstripped their quotes because they recognized the scriptures were meant to be the foundation of any legal um, structure of any nation. In a course of legal study, that's a law textbook that was written in 1836, he, the writer of that textbook said, the purity and sublimity of the morals of the Bible have at no time been questioned. Well, he didn't live today, did he? He wouldn't be able to say that today. It is the foundation of the common law of every Christian nation. It is the foundation of common law of every Christian nation. So. It is important what the Bible has to say about legal matters. So capital punishment is mentioned often in the Bible. I'm going to give you a few of them. The first of which we mentioned already before. Genesis, the ninth chapter, verse 6. Whoever sheds human blood by humans, their blood shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. Now... Those laws, or that particular commandment that God gave to uh, Noah and then gave uh, other commandments in the establishment of earthly government, in verse number 12, it says, this shall be for perpetual generations. In other words, God indicated to him very clearly that this, I'm not just telling you this, Noah, for this generation. What I'm telling you, for example, in regards to capital punishment is for perpetual generations. It is for humanity, mankind in general. Other detailed references regarding capital punishment are found in Exodus, the 21st chapter, 12 through 15. It goes into very, very great detail uh, in regards to what we would call manslaughter versus premeditated murder. And um, the Bible from the beginning differentiated between those accidental deaths. If you cause the accidental death of another person versus the purposeful premeditated death. And God provided places that the individual could flee to if they indeed had accidentally caused someone's death. Those were called cities of refuge. In those cities of refuge, an individual could literally run into the synagogue or, and, and go to the altar and they would be protected from any revenge, from those seeking revenge in a city of refuge because that was built into the law. So from the very beginning, as we will see later, God built in, remember, justice is the goal of God. Justice is his priority. And so Exodus 21, 12 through 15 and, and by the way, one of the laws of God, which we don't adhere to today, but, you know, the, in that day, they said anyone who attacks their father or mother is to be put to death. Not just kill them, anyone who attacks their parents are to be put to death. That has a way of engendering honor of your mother and father, doesn't it? 
And so that was included in Exodus, the 21st chapter. Leviticus 24, 17 through 23 is another uh, verbose section regarding capital punishment. And it also, in that is where we find the words eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And uh, there is even within that section instruction on what should happen if you kill a neighbor's animal and what that punishment should be. And as we will see later on, there's a purpose for that, uh, detailed, um, in, detailed instructions in regards to when capital punishment should and should, should not be carried out. Numbers 35, 9 through 34, and again, another very detailed scripture. I'm not going to read the entirety of these to you, but feel free to go into those and read those that, uh, if you would like, and, and you will see how much instruction God and how much specificity God gave to the people in regards to punishment and particularly capital punishment. Now, is there anything in the New Testament? Because quite often it leaps into our minds as Christians that, <clears throat> yes, the Old Testament, we see it as oft, often we see it as severe and as unbending and without mercy and without any grace. And we commonly refer to the day in which we live since the splitting of history by the coming and death and resurrection of our Lord, we see the time period we live in this dispensation as the age of grace. And so often I will hear when, whenever we're in a study or whenever I'm conducting or whenever I'm in a discussion with someone regarding certain facets of human behavior, certain laws, and I bring up the scripture, often what I will hear from well-intentioned individuals uh, and people in the church is, yes, but what does the New Testament say about that? And that's a legitimate question. But as we recognized in our first couple of lessons uh, regarding exegesis and regarding the interpretation of the scripture and theology, the Bible interprets the Bible. And the New Testament is not to destroy the old. In fact, Jesus himself said that. I came not to destroy the law, did he not? But I came to fulfill the law. And so the New Testament, as is commonly said, and I was taught, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And so we find that they build upon each other. Now, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to take my time. I may not, <clears throat> I shared this with my sounding board that I have at home. I, as, as I watch her, after, um, you know, 44 years of marriage, you read body language and microbursts of emotion. And I looked at her face and I stopped and I said, this is too much, isn't it? And she said, you're never going to get through that tomorrow. <laughs> Almost like, don't even try. <laughs> so we're, we're, and she's my time clock today. I left my phone up on the platform because I use it as a timer when I preach. It, it really doesn't help very much, but at least it's there. It informs me how much over I've gone when I glance at it. But, so we won't be able to get through all of this, but the, the New Testament reinforces and takes, shall I say, takes for granted. It, takes, it assumes a posture of assumption, I should say, a posture of assumption in regards to capital punishment. One of those places we find that is in Acts, the 25th chapter, verse 10 through 12, and it's Paul when appearing before the governor of Rome. And he said, if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. So Paul acknowledges the legitimacy of capital punishment with that statement. If I've done anything worthy of death, Paul is saying then there are items that he considered worthy of death. There are, there are grievances, shall I say, there are crimes and actions of man that are worthy of death. And then we find in Romans, the 13th chapter, verse 4, and that's a verse that we have used before in our first lesson, for, one, for the one in authority is God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. The word sword, sword there is used purposely 
In my study in the last couple of days, I had um, one of the books that I was digging deep on that particular scripture actually used a page and a half of discourse on just the word sword and what it meant. And the, and the word sword used in that day, as Paul used it in writing to the Romans, was unequivocally a reference to capital punishment. That it, that it was a reference to not just authority, but to, to retribution and capital punishment. First Peter then, the second chapter, verse 13 and 14, although not a specific reference to capital punishment, we'll be using this a little bit later. He said, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Herein, we see the two basic assignments of earthly government. Here we find the two basic assignments of earthly government. Number one, to promote the good. It says to commend those who do right. So number one, earthly government has the assignment to promote the good. And number two, to punish evil. So those are the two basic assignments given by God to government. So let's talk a little bit about some of the, the process and, and the, the, the Bible defines and distinguishes the process and the guardrails, the parameters of capital punishment. As we've already told you in some of these passages that I've read in the Old Testament, God begins to dig down into the details to help his people know when, those in government, to know when capital punishment is considered proportional and just. And so that is the very first thing that we need to reemphasize again, and that is that in the Bible, capital punishment is based upon God's priority of justice. Now, enforcing justice, and we're going to talk about that as opposed to mercy, enforcing justice is carried out through the punishment of evil and the rewarding of good to the standards of God's laws. It is to be carried out, carried out according to the, to the rules of fairness and righteousness without partiality. That was God's instruction and is God's instruction today. Psalm 82, 3 and 4. Yes, I put that up here. Psalm 82, 3 and 4 really is a great verse. Um, <clears throat> giving a window into God's feelings about and his care for justice. And Psalm 82, 3 and 4 says, Give justice to the weak and fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Now that is a breakdown and really, as I said, is a glimpse into the heart of God in his desire for justice. God is looking for individuals appointed by himself to represent the weak and the needy and the afflicted and those who have no voice for themselves. God is saying, I want to put into place a structure, a framework of authority in this world of chaos, because sin has entered, that will somehow give voice and protect and defend those who really can't do that for themselves. That's called justice, and that's God's concern. So keeping uppermost in mind God's concern is justice. Now, some would say that the New Testament, and I read many counter-arguments, I read philosophical papers while I'm doing my study for this because I don't want to present something to you that you are able in your own mind while you sit there and you may, you may politely not say anything, you're able to poke holes in the logic or the rationale in which I'm giving this to you. So I read, I read the opposing views. And there are many well-intentioned pastors and theologians and professors who are now advocating for the elimination of capital punishment because they believe we should, we should in fact enforce the law of love and mercy and grace. Now that we are in a period of grace, that the harshness of what we read in the Old Testament and the harshness of the reality of the early church and the day they lived in is not to be used as a basis 
for the ideal Christian atmosphere or for a Christian nation. So we should really live by the law of love and it should be applied to all of life and all circumstances. However, how many of you have ever heard of C.S. Lewis? <laughs> Tremendous, I love C.S. Lewis. Um, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, eh? C.S. Lewis. Screw tape letters, I mean, he, he just was a deep thinker. He was a, he was a philosopher that was converted to Christianity and he took that ability to think deep and brought that in as a gift into the church. And C.S. Lewis said, to abandon the criteria of, of righteous and just punishment is to abandon all criteria or all standards for punishment. So let us recognize that we need to draw a line in our thinking between mercy and justice. God is a God of mercy. But in regards to the control of evil on earth, his criteria is justice. Mercy is not receiving what I deserve. Justice is receiving what I deserve. And we will talk about that later on, mercy and justice. So has God abandoned mercy? Has God abandoned forgiveness in, in, in certain areas? No. Mercy and forgiveness and grace was brought by Jesus Christ. And um, we know that he brought with him the ability to receive God's forgiveness. And let me give you a living example of this in the New Testament that probably helps to illustrate it better than I could explain it. The difference between mercy and justice. Jesus is willingly dying on the cross. He's hanging between two thieves. One thief, as you know, reached out to him. And, and he, he actually rebuked the other guy on the other side of Jesus and said, we're getting what we deserve. This man hasn't done anything. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now somehow God had given that thief some type of insight that this was more than a human being hanging here next to him. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked at him and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. Well, obviously, that indicates forgiveness, mercy. Today you will be with me in paradise. But also note that Jesus did not immediately, miraculously take him down from the cross. He forgave him. He brought him into the kingdom. We will meet him someday if we get to heaven and we'll be able to talk with him, but he still paid the price that was, that was given to him by the civil government. And so there is a difference between justice and mercy. And we need to make sure that, this will, that, that we recognize that and we rightly divide so to speak, the word of truth. So it's based upon justice. Secondly, capital punishment in the Bible is based upon respect for life. Respect for, I should have put in there, human life. Capital punishment, as counter as that may seem, how in the, how in the world could not only the allowance but the commandment for capital punishment be motivated by a respect for human life. But it is. And we go back to Genesis 9, 6. It is because God has an immense respect for human life that he even initiated capital punishment to begin with. Remember, <clears throat> the first verse we read was, whoever sheds human blood, God said, by humans shall their blood be shed. Why? For in the image of God has God made mankind. For in the image of God has God made mankind. So God is saying that life is precious. That person's life is precious because they are created in my image. And so to protect and, and to reinforce respect for human life, there has to be a punishment equal to that which has already taken place. <clears throat> the third thing that we need to recognize, I'm making good headway, 
Now get ready for this because I had to write a lot closer. <laughs> and this is when my wife said, you're never going to get through that. And I didn't give you everything I've gotten in front, got in front of me. So the, the third point, the third parameter, the third guardrail, the third instruction regarding capital punishment and the insight that God gives us is that it fulfills the responsibility of government. Capital punishment refills, fulfills the God-given responsibility that he gave to government. We read in Romans 13, 4 and 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14, he addressed the role specifically of civil government. Now, I don't think I need to let you know this because we've covered it several times, but government is appointed by God. It said that very clearly in Romans 13, 4, Paul writing to the Romans. Now remember, he's writing to people that are under the boot heel and are oppressed by a government unlike our government. But, uh, well, <laughs> we're getting there, but un unlike our government. And um, he is telling them that as much as you may not like it, Government has been put into place by God. And he uses very strong language. He said, for he is God's servant. The person in government, you may not like him, you, you at all, but he is God's servant. And he went even further to call the individual in government a minister of God. Now that was, a, that was quite a swallow for the Romans. you telling me that that individual that is as mean as can be as a minister of God. And Paul is establishing that. Now, Jesus confirmed this. Um, we'll go into this in a moment. But Jesus confirmed this, and I don't know if I have it up here. But in John, the 19th chapter, verse 11, Jesus is standing before Pilate, and he confirmed the, the role of appointed government while on trial for his own life. He said, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. So Jesus himself, the Son of God, and, and that had to be quite a shocker to, to Pilate. I mean, he had, it, it had the audacity and arrogance of this Galilean to stand in front of him. And we, you have to understand, you talk about protocol. The protocol in that day to be summoned before a Roman procurator and all the power and the trappings that were with it, even in Jerusalem, nothing compared to Rome. But in Jerusalem, I mean, the, the, the level of wealth and, um, you know, in our day, we can't understand it. Well, we have some examples. I, my wife and I were in the West Wing one time to meet with one of the um, president, President Bush's um, appointees. And we met in the Indian Treaty Room. And the Indian, have any of you taken a tour of the Capitol or of the White House, I'm sorry? Yes. Many years ago. Many years ago. <laughs> well, I don't know if they take you into the Indian Treaty Room, but what we had to go through in 90 some degree weather to even get in to that West Wing, you, there were TV series on the West Wing, to even get into the West Wing of the White House. And it was quite interesting while we were there and meeting, uh, the helicopter landed in the Rose Garden behind us with the president. So to look out the windows and see, you know, the helicopter come down was pretty impressive. Pretty, good, pretty big show of power right there, by the way. And uh, there are some people who think they have power, and there's some people who do have power. And, and that was reality. But, but they told us how much the gold on the walls, the gold gilt walls in the Indian Treaty Room, you can look it up. And they told us at that time, and I can't imagine what it is now, the, the way gold has gone up, how much the gold on the walls alone was worth. And so here's Jesus being ushered in before Pilate. And all of the trappings and the power and the centurions and the guards and everything. And he looks this guy in the face and says, you'd have no authority over me. I like that. I say, go Jesus, right? Go Jesus. You'd have no authority over me, except unless it was given to you from above. So he acknowledged that civil government 
and earthly government has authority that has been granted by God Almighty. If anybody was going to take away that question, it was the Lord. Because he was there when it was, when it was doled out, right? And so government, regardless of what we think of it, has been given an appointment and an assignment from God, from God Almighty. Now, God has given government an assigned role regarding punishing evil. They are to promote good and, as I said, punish evil. He's given them the power of the sword. Now, the duties of government are many, but we're going to stick with this. I think it's important that we recognize that in 13.4, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uses some unusual language. He says that they are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on wrongdoers. Agents of wrath, that comes from the Greek word that means avenger. That God has appointed the government to be the avenger of those that have been wrongfully, uh, those who have be, been the victims. So often nowadays, the victims are the ones who are accused and found guilty, so to speak, and the perpetrator is the one that seems to be protected. It's a reversal of justice. But God's intention was that government serve as the protector and indeed the avenger of those who have no power to avenge themselves. So they have an assigned role regarding punishing evil. And the role of the government is distinct from the role, I don't have it on here, but the role of government is distinct from, from the role of the kingdom. Now, for all of those that, please don't misunderstand me, I'm not going down the avenue of separation of church and state, although that is legitimate. But the separation of church and state, not in the Constitution, but in a letter to the Danbury Baptist by Thomas Jefferson, assuring them that the government will not control what the church does. So the separation of church and state is not to protect the government from the church, but to ch protect the church from the government. Okay? But there are two distinct roles, even within the scripture. The church has been given the assignment of evangelism. Jesus spoke to the church and said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He didn't tell the government to do that. The government is to protect and to promote and promote good and protect against evil, but he didn't tell the government. The government is not God's tool of evangelism in the world. He left that up to the church, to the kingdom of God, to, to the church, so to speak, the government of the church. And there is a government of the church. Even the coming together, the gathering together of the ecclesia, as you've heard me teach before, that Greek word ecclesia for the church, the coming together of the church, is actually a secular term used by the Romans and by the Greeks, and it was a reference to civil government. It was a reference to like the city fathers coming together. It was a formal gathering together of government officials. And God uses that term ecclesia to, to call us purposely the church as a coming together, so to speak, of government officials. Government officials of what government? The government of the kingdom of God. The government of God's, of the heavenly kingdom. So there is a role to the heavenly kingdom and there's a distinct role to the earthly government or civil government. And so they, we must break that down even further because people get confused between the instructions God has given to us as individual believers as a part of the kingdom of heaven and the instructions that he has given to civil government and God, body politics, so to speak, that is meant to represent the people. And we find that very clearly. Here's, here's let, me, let me get into it a little bit. Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, addresses personal responsibility. Where we get into trouble is if we apply Matthew 5 to the government. All right? For example, Matthew 5, 19 or 39 says, If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, well-meaning intentioned Christians have, and well-intentioned Christians have applied that verse 
to the role of government. And they're saying that Jesus, therefore, has changed the whole, the whole rule book and has said that government should turn the other cheek. Therefore, there should not be any capital punishment. And that also, by the way, Roman, or Matthew 5.39 is one of the base scriptures used to form the uh, theology, the philosophy of pacifism, of which you and I are living in a stronghold of pacifism. The friends, the society of friends were pacifists. That's what they were known for. Turn the other cheek. And, and to apply that, I, I submit to you to apply that to government activity and responsibility is a misconstruing and a misapplication of the scripture. Because what God commands you and I to do is different than his appointed and assigned role for government. That is found in Romans 4 minutes. That is found in, in, in fact, Paul said, well, let, I guess I'm going to stop here. Let's go back to this turning the other cheek. <clears throat> to turn the other cheek, follow, follow this line of thinking. To turn the other cheek, even in itself, is limited in its scope of application and command. Why? To have the choice to turn the other cheek assumes that the individual has the choice and the power and the ability to turn the other cheek. It would be foolish for us to apply turn the other cheek to a, forgive me ladies, but to a lady who is being attacked by a 350 pound lineman and he slaps her in the face and God says you turn the other cheek that is not the God I serve that is to that is to someone who has the power to not turn the other cheek and therefore God is saying don't do what you have the ability to do which is to go after them but turn the other cheek therefore that leads me into this question that some have had do I have a Christian right to defend my family as a man and as a father? You not only have the right, you have the responsibility, you have the obligation. To apply turn the other cheek to someone who, let's, let's say, breaks into your home and now has captured your children and your wife and is beating them, perhaps molesting them. And for you to believe that God says, turn the other cheek, turn the other cheek, turn the other cheek, is a gross misapplication of the scripture. God would expect you as a man to do everything you can. Again, remember, one of the, one of the obligations of government is resist evil. One of the obligations we have as well is if I can stop evil, I need to stop it. I'll get ahead of myself, but, but there is a time for superior force. Let's stop it with this and it'll it will cause you to begin to think. There are exceptions to turning the other cheek. And if we would apply that as a whole to all of life in any nation, it would result in anarchy. And we're beginning to see that, by the way, in some of these democratic-run cities where they have told the police to stand down. And we're seeing crime. What was there, a hundred and some murders in Chicago? on one weekend. If that had been in Israel, it had been all over the news. But because it's in Chicago, but we're, we're seeing the results of this application of stand down. So the shooter that I'm going to talk about that today, the shooter that was on that roof and, and had a semi-automatic rifle and evidently a lot of rounds of ammo, should someone have climbed up on the roof and begin to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to him while he was shooting? Or was there the need for superior force to legitimately stop the killing that was going on? I see you nodding your head. God is, our God is not nuts, okay? Our, our, God, is, our God is not 
our God, again, priority is justice. Justice. What needed to happen? Someone needed to stop that shooter. Someone needed to stop him. That's the reason Gary Cooper, by the way, and the actor in Sergeant York, that's the reason Sergeant York, and I think I told you, my childhood pastor knew him. He knew, he knew Sergeant York, Alvin York. Alvin York became a holiness preacher in later life. And my childhood pastor actually paired up with him in camp meetings and they would take turns preaching. He said that bothered him the rest of his life, but the reason that he was able to kill, you know, he, he was a conscientious objector. He was a pacifist and he was not going to kill anyone. But his reason, as you may remember, is that when he saw those, he said, when I saw those guns killing all of my friends and killing all of those people, he said, I knew someone had to stop those guns. That's the whole reason he did it. And so when they interviewed him, they said, you mean you did that to save life? And he said, yes, sir. That's why I did it, was to save life, not to take life. Okay, I'm reading your faces. Am I on the right track? Are you? We're going to have to finish up at another time. Is it time? And my wife was correct. As always, I didn't get through it. But some of this is really good. It, to be proportional, we're going to use legal Latin terminology, lex talionis. What does that mean that's used even today? God said it needs to be proportional and not revenge, but retribution. What's the difference there? And then we have summaries here that we'll, we'll go over in regards to does it eliminate mercy and grace. Okay? We'll get deeper into this next one. All right. God bless you.